So Bob, you right. you started in comics before you went into animation. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I uh, I worked at Marvel Comics. I was a street caricature artist and a portrait artist, traveling around doing that. And uh, and I was in uh, which Cape Cod. Uh, every summer to do caricatures. And I met a caricature artist there named Gary Hallgren, great character, great uh, underground cartoonist from back in the day. And uh, he introduced me to Larry Hama at Marvel Comics. And next thing you know, I'm uh, doing movie parodies for Crazy Magazine, uh, worked on G.I. Joe, The Nam, uh, Bizarre Adventure, Savage Tales. And uh, I inked a, a, a shit ton of uh, Yusema Conan. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I was doing, doing Marvel Comics. I see. Uh, how was working with uh, Larry Hama on G.I. Joe? It was easy. It was great. Uh, if, if you brought in the art and it sucked, he would tell you it sucked. And then he'd laugh at you. Oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> you know, but, but uh, then he'd show you how to do it right. It was great. I was lucky to work in the Marvel bullpen. I learned a lot. It was like going to college and getting paid for it. All the old guys were still there. They weren't dead yet. They were all about 10 minutes away from being dead, but they weren't dead yet, and they were, they were like, great to work with and really fun. A roommate of mine was working on Thundercats, yes. the first season, and a guy named Jim Meskimen, and he decided he wanted to be a famous uh, a comedian and actor, which is what he is now. Uh, so he said, look, I'm quitting Thundercats. I'm doing character design, so you want to do the job. So I got a job working on Thundercats, and yeah. I've been in animation since then. Right, and um, what kind of work were you doing for Thundercats? Character designs, background designs, prop designs, uh -huh. uh, you know, things like that. Yeah. Whatever they needed drawn. And then, um, what was that uh, company that was making Thundercats? Um, it was Rankin Bass. That's right. Same people who did all those great Christmas specials right. across through the snow. Right. And, and then they went out of business a little bit after that, and then you went... Um, uh, you worked, uh, who did you work for after Rankin Bass? Deke. Deke, that's Deke, right. Deke, yeah, I went, worked out of Deke. I, I worked on uh, Alf Tales for about a half hour. Mm -hmm. and uh, The Real then, Ghostbusters? Then I moved on to the Real Ghostbusters, yeah, yeah. I worked on that. And right. that was fun. Uh, and then that's where I met John Kay. And uh, between working on, oh, then, then uh, I, I switched from Ghostbusters and worked on the New Adventures of Beanie and Cecil with John K. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was all the same people that made Mighty Mouse. Crazy bunch of mofos, those guys were. And uh, they, they, it was their mission in life to piss people off. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I, I threw them with the, the right and the wrong bunch all at the same time. So did your responsibilities in animation just increase with each, the next show you went on? You were doing more and more? Yeah, or? because I don't know how to say no. And they say, oh, can you run a, a, a you know, a multi-million dollar animation show? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm, I stupidly say yes. Uh, but, yeah, it's tough. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard. Animation's a terrible business. Animation is a terrible business. It's, it's dirty business, folks. Our <laughs> advice to you is, for you young people who come all starry-eyed before us today and want to know how you get an animation, I, I tell you, get your ass in med school. It's, you know, you, you forget all about the, the showbiz and the residuals and the money when, when you're knee-deep in some Shriner's intestines trying to, trying to fish out a polyp the size of a Buick. Then you'll feel a lot better when you, when you see that money come in. I got it. Not, not the new Buicks, like the old ones, the big heavy ones, like a, a 58. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a big Buick, a lot of chrome. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a really big car. So what were we talking about cars? I'm sorry. <laughs> so now, um, something that I have a question on on the real Ghostbusters. Were, were you guys not allowed to use the likenesses of the actors? Um, for That's true. We weren't allowed to use the likenesses of the actors. We had to use the, the, the crappy designs we were given. I see. I don't know who designed those. I hope, I hope nobody's here. No, no chance. Question. So, um, <laughs> and working in animation, were you kind of glad to be out of comics? Did you miss comics at the time? Mm, I was kind of, yeah, I was glad to be out of comics because comics really wasn't a way to make money. But like 10 minutes after I quit doing comics, they started paying residuals. Okay. So people started making money in comics right after I got after, out. I see. But, uh, um, so the work, the, the pay was better, the pension and all that, that was better? Yeah, they, no, no, no. And, you know, if... If anybody wants to make a living as an artist, you know, it's not, that's not the reason to be an artist, you know. 
anyway. So then um, transition us from uh, Real Ghostbusters. You worked on a few projects up into Ren and Stimpy. Uh, give us that segue. Well, I worked on Tiny Tunes. Tiny uh, Tunes, I, yeah. Tiny Tunes. That was awful. It was, it was just a terrible experience. A lot of people really love that show. Oh, Tiny Tunes. Draw Buster. I just want, don't want to draw Buster. But it was, it was, it was like a lot of people work in the animation business get really fed up with just churning out shit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I know you know you get it. You get an awful script. You know, it's terrible. And and you you have to say, okay, am I going to be a big jerk and say, wow, this really sucks? Yeah, go. Well, no, don't lose your place either, yeah. though. But I mean, this is kind of how we did Space Ghost. And in the beginning, the guys got kind of mad at me. They thought I was being disrespectful. But I've been way too free form my entire life. I, I come from a radio background and then TV and then improv. And the improv part was totally self-taught. Foxworthy and Leno both were really encouraging, but I couldn't hack the lifestyle, the smoke-filled rooms, all of that stuff. But it reached a point where my guys realized that it was not being disrespectful or unpleasant about what they had written. It's just like these tangents appear in my mind. Or if you're a mathematician, cotangents, they, these things pop in my head and I would go on these sidetracks. Well, they finally came to terms with it. I just worked with Matt Malero. And instead of the old days where it's like, could you read what's there, please? This time it was hysterical because Matt says, if you can just get the opening line and the last line, because the last line transitions into a dream sequence, and you can do anything you want in the middle, because it's about radio, and I know you hate radio. And sure enough, I went off on it. I did this horrible Rick D story, which was completely true, by the way. Anyway, a lot of guys get kind of in a twit about that, don't they? Because they want you to stick to the letter of what they were. It's a control thing. You know, and a lot of writers are like that. You know, they like, those are my words. Don't change my words. They're important words. No, throw your words out. Come up with funnier words. Oh, what a dude. What a dude. And he owed me money. But, uh, um, so, yeah, it, it's funny. Uh, um, it's a tough business, and, and it'll ruin you. Like, I teach. I teach at the School of Visual Arts in New York. Right. I, I teach... Uh, like kids right out of high school, how to do animation storyboards. And day one, I'd go, don't. Get up. Go out now. Just go. Go away. Because I can't, you, you'll become me. You'll turn into me and you'll be a sorry, bitter old man. You know, <laughs> he just walks around bitching all the time about how, how, you know, it's a terrible business. And the thing is, it's sad, is you take somebody who will, like, he'll, he, he'll do what he does whether there's anyone to hear him doing it or not. It's true, right? It's, he, it's just a radio. You turn him on and he starts talking. You know, so you got to either leave at, at home. That's right. That's right. You're, you're, you're doing color. on. Bill Nelson was running for Senate in Florida. And I swear to God, alone, nobody at home, just sitting there, they do that tag at the end of the commercial. And I was always the one going, I Bill Nelson, I approve this message. And then the message starts getting watered down. I Bill Nelson, I like to go to the bathroom with the door open. I Bill Nelson, I like to see naked pictures of, you know, ducks. I Bill Nelson, I want to hang out in your backyard touching the pool. Yeah, so so I tell my students, look, you can if this is what you want to do, this is this is like what you're built for. It's it's in you. It's got to come out. It's your dream, and you do it whether you got paid or not. Yeah, come on, I'll show you how, yeah. and we'll have a good time, and and I'll I'll teach you how to not not maybe become such a big jerk like I am and be and do well, you know. But if you're not, just pick something else. And I and I I see kids coming in, they're struggling with just real basic drawing skills, and I'm, and I teach them, and I spend a lot of time with them. But it's, sometimes I just want to go. Just don't. Just don't do this because you're not going to, you know, you're wasting your parents' money. But you can't do that because the school frowns on that. Right. They don't even like me to give students C's. You know, the students get really upset and they go to the counselor, he gave me a C. <laughs> I got a C. I've never had a C. It's, it's, a, weird, it's a weird thing. So, so uh, I don't really 
want to spend the rest of my life doing uh, animation. Who are you working on these shows lately? What do you hear? Twelve Ounce Mouse. That was the thing I just did with Malero, and Malero's great. Uh, in the old days, they finally got it, and and. Thank God he's got a good memory, because Clay remembered almost every goofy thing I ever did. I can't remember anything I did. It's like I go into some fugue state while I'm doing it, and you could see the kids doing time code, and the producer would go, mark it, mark it, mark it, mark it. And these are just the outtakes. They'd go back, sift out what they wanted, and, you know, pick and choose. But once people got the hang that that's how I worked, that looks like I would give them the one the way they wrote it. Uh, Keith Crawford told me, uh, the other big wig at the network, it's always at the end of the closing credits, executives in charge of production, Mike Lazo, Keith Crawford. Keith is the one who gave me the title Vice President of Lunch. I'm the Vice President of Lunch at Cartoon Network. Uh. Keith says apparently we've got another unicorn coming for Robot Chicken. Never did grown men laugh harder than the disgusting unicorn on Robot Chicken. It's filthy dirty. And I'll tell you a secret for all the guys grinning and giving me the knowing nod. It's the women who come to the table and buy the pictures. They're the ones going, honey, look, it's the unicorn. Isn't that funny? So there's a little bit of robot. There's, I did an American Dad last year. We did uh, the long bomb. Played the Texas oil billionaire Cyrus Mooney. Killed me in the debut episode. Thank you very much. So now I can only come back with a dream sequence. Or if my friend Bob writes something, comes up with something new, maybe Space Ghost will get work again. No pressure there, Bob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to ask you, speaking of Space Ghost, did, did you ever meet Gary Owens? I did. I was heartbroken. And... Lazo told some weird little lie, like, man, if you and Gary Owens were in the same room, he'd take a swing at you. And I'm like, yeah, I can just see Gary Owens with, like, his zillions of dollars. Very gentle, I had heard. Uh, yeah, he was very, he was very funny. Uh, uh, I, got to, I got to direct Gary Owens doing Powder uh, Toast. He was Powder Toast man. Never got and, to meet him. Uh, one one day they hit, we had a video camera and they were aiming it at Gary, and uh, I I do okay Gary Owens, but but uh, uh, I said, Gary, tell tell me about Bob Camp, and he said, he would always put the, the hand up and he'd go, one day Bob Camp went over to Sherry Lewis's house, took off his left sock, threw it in the road, and yelled, "Lamb chop's been shot." <laughs> Isn't it great? He just said that right off the bat. He was really funny. We're great to work with, and whenever you give him a line, he'd go, right you are, perfect, no problem. And he was just gentle and kind and funny, and he always made stuff 50% funny. That was my hero. He was, he was great. And you know, the you know, old guys are why I ended up doing this crazy thing. He was he was the real thing, though. He went back to radio. He was like the real, real guy. Music of your life. He and had I, Wink I got, Martindale. And... I got to work with him. I got to work. I got to direct Jack Carter. The most bitter man in Hollywood. And that was a title that Milton Berle gave him, which makes it worse, right? <laughs> I saw Berle. I was this close to Berle once. I was at a thing in L.A. They were doing, it was like the top radio stations got to go. I had a killer morning show in Atlanta. This was before Clay and I got Space Ghost. Yeah. And they sent all the top stations. Ronnie Shell, who I think the biggest Ronnie thing Shell. Ronnie ever did. Remember him on, on, what was it, Gomer Pyle? He was on everything. Always played. Gomer's buddy tried to get him in trouble. Yeah. He was in Blazing Saddles when he comes in and asks for the sheriff, and the sheriff's not there, and he does the turn. Sheriff, you've got to come quick. Mongo's loose. He's over there. Sheriff, you've got yeah. to come quick. Mongo's loose. Yeah, he was kind of, kind of a buck tooth guy. He goes up. He was so proud that he actually knew Milton Berle, and I felt bad for him because I was there when Milton Berle shot him down. He walks up, marches up, standing ramrod straight, and he goes, Mr. Berlinger, Ronnie Shell, I was with you on the cavalcade of toast. Or some yeah, other weird yeah. show that Berle did. Berle takes the cigar out, looks at him and goes, uh-huh, walks off. 
<laughs> that was that was, that his, was it. So it's it not. Like, it's like you say. It's not the most warm and fuzzy business. So when you meet somebody nice, it's no, rare. No, and no, no. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this story since you're here. You're gonna appreciate it. So Jim Gomez and I uh, were invited to lunch by Jack Carter. And Jack Carter was the guy, he was Mr. Saturday Night. He had a show on right after Sid Caesar. And he was a really funny guy and a hard worker and just like really worked hard. Everything he did, he did with everything he had, you know, real gravelly voice guy. And so we went to, uh, he said, come on, I'm, I'm taking you to lunch. Get it. All right, all right. So we go, we go to this restaurant. It's in Beverly Hills. And it's in kind of a, a big shopping center area. And um, so we go back between some stores and then in, there's a big... Uh, plaza, cafe kind of a thing in the middle. And as you look across, everyone you see is a celebrity. But they're kind of old school celebrities, right? And they're having lunch and everything. And and we walk in behind Jack Carter's um, 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 and everyone spots it. And they all see him coming in. And we're walking behind him. And he walks up to the maitre d' and he goes, oh, Mr. Carter, hi. And Jack looks over and the main table, like the, when you walk in, it's like, this is the, where the boss sits. And uh, he says, uh, yeah, my table. He goes, no, no, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but uh, Mel Blank Jr. is going to be sitting at this table today. He reserved it. He goes, Blank, Schmeck, fuck you. He grabbed that thing and goes, right, sit down, sit down. And so everybody in the place, one by one, that was famous, came through and paid homage to the king. They, they, they came in and it was really weird. And every person who came through, he'd go, yeah, that guy he cheated on his wife and he killed her. Nobody found out about it. He buried her in the backyard. He knew dirt on everybody. You know, and he, you know, like, oh, that guy, he lost his mind and he ate his poodle. he just make up something. Or, no, I just made that up. But, but he would say stuff about him and he knew dirt on everybody. That guy, that guy over there, he's a leg breaker for the mob. You see that guy? He owes me a thousand bucks. The bum. You know, and he knew dirt on everybody. But uh, who came by? Uh, Norman Lear came up. Uh, uh, all these great singers, uh, uh, Damone, Damone, um, Vic Damone came up, uh, uh, Jerry Cormack came up, all these great comedians, uh, Norm MacDonald came up, and everybody paid homage to him. So I got, I got, I got to direct uh, Frank Orshin. That's serious. Anybody know who Frank Orshin is? Who knew some Frank Orshin was? He was the Riddler on the 1966 Batman, the guy with the hideous laugh and stuff. I got to direct him. I've been pretty lucky. You know, I've got to work with some good guys. Tell everyone uh, how you got into Ren and Stimpy, because once you got into Ren and Stimpy, that kind of set that kind of set your career for a while after well, that. Well, I was working on Tiny Tunes and uh, really hating it. And uh, John Kay, I had worked with John Kay on, uh, previously on The New Adventures of Beanie and Cecil, and he got us all fired. Isn't that weird? Wait, no, he always does that. Uh, but uh, he, he got everybody fired, and so he was at home, and he couldn't find work. He was sitting in his, in his kitchen in his tall chair, chain-smoking cigarettes and drinking like Molson on ice. And Because uh, he's Canadian. It's what they drink. So uh, uh, I uh, got a job at uh, Tiny Tunes. And so how did I get that job? Oh, they called me up and said, "You want we're going to make cartoons just like... Um, Looney Tunes. Just like, just like the original Looney Tunes, like the Termite Terrace cartoon. And it's going to be storyboard artist driven and it's not going to be writer driven, which was a lie. So I went and worked on that. And I was kind of miserable and John and I were kind of hanging out a lot. And uh, so uh, we were pitching shows around. And he had a show idea that he had created in college, which was called Your Gang, kind of a parody of our gang. And Vanessa Coffey was, uh, do you know Vanessa? I don't. Uh, she's great. She's a great producer. She uh, created the Nicktoons thing. She uh, sold Nickelodeon on the idea of doing being a cartoon-driven network, because it wasn't at that point. And so uh, she said, you need to find creative people, uh, creators who can, who can come up with their own characters, create their own characters, and give them a show and let them make a show that they create. So uh, that was how we got in. But, they didn't like the, the show idea at all. They did like the dog and the cat. Oh, we like the dog and the cat. Use them. Do something about them. That's how we got Rain and Stimpy. We, we did a pilot, which ran in the uh, Spike and Mike Animation Film Festival. Oh, nice. uh, and got great reviews. And so they, we got a series, and we did four seasons of it. Billy, Billy West. Yeah, you know Billy? Oh, yeah. Billy's so funny. He's... And, 
He's a killer. And I've never, you're pretty good, but I've never known anybody that can do as many voices as he can do. And he can do anyone. He can imitate anyone perfectly. Uh, he, he used to do some funny stuff over the intercom at the studio. I can't say a mixed company. But, but uh, yeah, I got to work with Billy. Billy's great. Billy always brings so much to the table. He's like you. He, he you know, he, 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 you ask for five bucks and you get a million. He gives you much more than you expect. And he brings a lot to the party and a lot of the good comedy. I mean, Billy is stiffy. I'll tell you, well, I had a quick visit with Billy over the years, like a hundred times. We've, we've done a bunch of sci-fi shows together. And it's almost like now I know the cues, and it's like he's starting to know my weird cues. But whenever they throw out the question to him, hey, Billy, is there ever anything you wanted to do that you didn't get to do? I know it's going to be the then story. He wanted to be the then voice. And it's always like you start off with, Tonight on Action News, meet a hippopotamus that can type its own name. <sighs> Why did this man cook and eat his own? That's my rejoinder. Why would this man cook and eat his own family? Find out on Action News tonight at 6 and 11. That's, it's the then thing. And I've bumped into him so many times now that it's like we always have fun together. And I lean over the last time in St. Augustine. I'm like, who's the guy in the middle? He says, I don't know, he was like a screaming duck in a video game or something, just be nice. And I'm like, okay, you know, because you would never want to let somebody down who's starting and, you know, coming along. And you could ultimately end up working for somebody that you're giving a rough time to. But I've always had such good fun with him every time. I'm like, he's, he's one guy who can do everything. He can do, he's a really talented musician. We're talking about Billy West, the guy that does Ren and Snippy. He didn't originally do Ren, you know, John Kay did Ren's voice. He ended up being both because John went and got himself fired, dummy. Uh, so then after Ren and Stimpy, the new millennium, had, do you feel like animation has changed? Is it forever changed into yeah. something? Is it less fun, more fun? What are your thoughts? I, you know, I don't watch cartoons. Is that weird? I don't watch. I've seen The Simpsons twice. Right. I don't. I, it's like I, I always have something I need to do. I got to work or, or something, and, and I'd rather watch an old movie. Uh, it's, it's like I go pitch shows to, to networks, right? Yes. And I go into to Nickelodeon, and I pitch shows. This happened a while back. And I pitch shows, and they go, well, that's not really what we're looking for. And I'd say, well, what are you looking for? Uh, and she would say, oh, well, we're looking for something they, uh, that our children or at least if they're not children, they should act like children, and they don't need to be too smart, and they don't necessarily need to be human or animals, and they can live in a strange place. And I say, hmm, you mean like SpongeBob? Yes, like SpongeBob. And my attitude is, look, why would I want to copy a cartoon that's a copy of a cartoon I already did? Right. I don't really like cartoons. My, my youngest son really liked Family Guy. They offered me a job on Family Guy. When oh, yeah? They, for, yeah, they, they asked me if I wanted to per, per, be the producer on it. And they showed me the pilot, and I said, no, it's like a bad Simpsons ripoff. Yeah, I don't like oh, it. I so I probably there. screwed up. You know, I could have been, like, rolling in dough now, but take the money, Bob. Take the money. I would have been, I would have, I would have been uh, uh, Seth MacFarlane's boy. Oh, my God. His homie, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? First of all, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, okay, he's a great talented cartoon. See, I, this is the bitter me talking. This is the really jealous bitter me talking. It's like, okay, he's handsome. All right, he's handsome. Oh, and he can sing like Harry Connick Jr. Great. He can sing like Harry Connick Jr. Oh, and he's a jillionaire. Oh, he's a jillionaire. Everything touches turns to gold. Yeah. Oh, but the best, <laughs> here's the best story. And I know this story because he told me the story himself. Back in 2001-ish, he was at an airport waiting for a flight, and he decided to go have a drink, and he got drunk, and he missed his flight, which plowed into a field in Pennsylvania on September 11. He was on one of those. He should have been on one of those planes, but he didn't get on. Wow. This is a man who sold his soul to the devil. Yeah, he came out I'm good. Connected, you know, and there's a, there's a really ugly old painting of him upstairs in his attic. Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray. All I, right. I nice. just, you know, he's just too successful. I don't so, know. Um, so yeah. George, I want to ask you some. Uh, oh, wait a minute, so, hey, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen, Alex 
Alex has a question for me. <laughs> By the way, if you're an orthopod or if you're training to be an orthopod, could somebody please grab the long forceps and pull my tailbone back out? These seats. My God, Bob. This, these seats are like, this is the seat company should be named the beginning of your impacted bowel seat company. <laughs> I'm just, Oh my God! So, it convention seats, uh, not to be confused with convention coffee and robot soap dispenser. Which, by the way, if I come back as a hitman in another life, robot soap guy is dead. Oh, and the, the water thing—you put it under there. Oh, it never comes good out. luck! Yeah. Good luck! You put your hand waiting for the soap, and, and it makes this little noise like Grandpa first thing in the morning. <laughs> Nothing. I'm getting, and then you go to like three more. <laughs> now I've scared the family. I'm sorry, sir. Be sure and join us this Sunday, though. I've just been hired by the Osteen Ministries as a warm-up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so what's the question, George, Alex? Um, tell us how uh, you got into And I'm deaf as a post, even with a mic. Animation voiceover. How did you get into that from the stand-up comedy into voiceover? It was one of these things where kind of like Billy, at one point Billy worked for Howard Stern. Well, the radio guys loved me <laughs> until they got to know me because I could do all all the voices. They go, you know, hey, we're doing this thing with Bullwinkle. It was like Simpson stuff. It didn't have to be perfect, but you know, it, you would know who it is. So you'd go and you'd go, hey, hey, Rocky, watch me pull this impacted thing out of my bow. You know, and Rocky would go, again? You know, and here it goes over before. Again? That trick never worked. I better get another head. <laughs> yeah. So then, you know, when my voice was higher before I'd hit the basement, you know, I used to be able to do a really serviceable Johnny Olson. They're like, Mitch Foodman, come on down. You are the next contestant. Then I fell in love with Pardo, and they were like, oh, you got to do a Don Pardo at the end of every show. So we started doing these fake products. What, what year was this, roughly? This would have been... Well, I was doing radio in Tampa in like 83. Oh, okay. There was a steamroller station back then called Q105. It was a runaway, just a monster. 60-some share of the audience. Every other radio station around them tanked. I'd go in every day, and at the end of the show, it'd be like, today's show brought to you by Tongue Brothers Ball Game Wieners. They plump when you touch them. Thank you, Don. We'll see you tomorrow, folks. With today's show brought to you by Patty Putin. Pour dry mix and airtight sandy pants. Go for a stroll. In 30 minutes, you've got savory Patty Putin. Now in tapioca. Thanks, Don. We'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody. So I start doing that. Then friends start daring me. And the, the line is so bad. Am I okay doing a horrible line with the ladies? Are the ladies going to rebel and hit me with shoes if I do a horrible line? Do it. I said something politically incorrect to a friend of mine one day. She laughed and said, I dare you to work that into the closing credits. The next morning we end the show and I go, today's show brought to you by the world's smallest hand vacuum, the Rug Goblin. <laughs> Works great for RVs, automobiles, even your boat. Every woman loves a Rug Goblin. She calls ten minutes later, I drove her off the highway. I'm in a ditch and you're going to come pull me out with your tow chain. I don't have a toe chain. But that's how it happened for me. I was able to do all these weird voices, you know, paid for by campaign to elect another loser to office who will disappoint us like nobody else before. You know, they'd say, oh, can you fill this in? And wow, you'd go, okay. yeah. And then it'd be like the smarmy host. Hi, everybody. Rick Dees. Oh, welcome. Hey, everybody. Super show. Hey, great to see you. How are you? Nice to see you. How's it going? Paying me no attention at all. Hi, nice, just careful going up now. Hold the handrail. Thank you. And God bless this man who's cleaning up the vomit from everyone who went to the Bob and George panel. Mopping up pools of vomit from our audience. So what was the question? So then um, tell us how you got into Space Ghost. Literally fell into it down the hall doing, you know, Animal House oh, tomorrow on okay. TBS. <laughs> the Blues Brothers yeah. again. And... The, the producers had so darn much fun that eventually they sent me down the hall. Uh -huh. I read... And, and that was in the... the what, outtakes what, 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 year did it. what year did that end up happening? That would have been 93. 93, yeah. Yeah, which was our pre-production year, and then I met Clay, 
And somebody, I think it was Crawford, had the epiphany. Keep them separate. That way, when George blurts something out, or if Clay blurts something out, then we've got it without them crossing over. And in L.A., everybody wants you to read it like a play. They're all in the room together. We used to separate people out. I, I, What's that? I would, when I directed Ren and Snippy, I would direct people one at a time. I didn't put everybody in a room. We ended up doing that later on other shows because people like to work that way. But it didn't occur to me to do that. And you never know when you'll get a pearl. So we, we kind of, I think we kind of started that back then. It, at the time, it was Simpsons and Us. And I looked at Billy's resume, and I'm just stunned. I sit there each time, and I go, man, if I had half of Billy's cartoons, I'd be living on an island like Marlon Brand. So I, I used to live in, in uh, uh, North Hollywood, and I would go shopping at this fancy uh, supermarket in uh, Glendale. <clears throat> and uh, fancy supermarket, I can't, I can't remember the name of it. But you'd see celebrities in there, you know. And uh, so I push in my cart, and I look in front of me, and I see a big, fat, old man pushing a cart real slow. And I look at him from the back, and I know instantly it's Jonathan Winters. I could just tell by the shape of him. And he's hunched over, and he's kind of barely moving, and he's putting stuff on his cart, and he's moving along. Well, I'm like buying Pampers, you know, car parts. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm following him. For your so, children, hopefully. For, yeah, so, so. Cause you weren't got, buying the adult version. Fix my car. Uh, so I end up in line behind him, right? And, uh, and Jonathan Winters is the funniest human that ever lived. Really the funniest human that ever lived. So um, he's in line in front of me, and he's kind of hunched over like this and looking down and watching. And he's, uh, he, he looks like he's frozen up in pain and being old and everything, but his eyes are darting around, like really sharp. So he's not missing anything. And I, I'm just soaking in every minute of it. So uh, the girl who's bagging his groceries is staring at him. And she's putting her stuff in. And he notices she's staring at him. And she says, say, wait a minute. Aren't you? Aren't you? And he says, if you say Dom DeLuise, I'll kill you. <laughs> Isn't that great? It's the best line ever. So I said, so I picked up, I said, my dear, this is Jonathan Winter. He looks around at me like that, you know, with the eyes. Looks around at me and he says, and I said, it's the funniest man that ever lived. And in the movie, it's a mad, 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 mad world. He destroyed an entire gas station with his bare hands. And he went, yes, I did. Ha! And he grabbed his groceries and he went away and he was all happy and jouncy and stuff. <laughs> so I made Jonathan Winter's day. I got to, yeah, I didn't get to meet him or anything, but, but that was fun. Well, sure you did. I did. I, I got to tell a story about him destroying it. We got nothing like that in Florida. And every time anything hip happens, I live in Lakeland, which is, if you're an Edward Scissorhands fan, we have, well, we've got the shopping center where they shot it. And that big, giant orange arch is not a fake. And in the middle of the store, there's like this little mall, and that's the shop where the, the beautiful woman seduces or tries to seduce Edward. And the only time anything cool ever happens is Lakeland. In Lakeland is when a film crew comes through. And they totally take for granted what I do. Publix is there, one of the biggest grocery chains in the world. I can't get a Publix spot because they think I'm too weird. And everything they do is super sugary and nice. And Thanksgiving, honest to God, they'll make you cry. They hire really, really talented Screen Actors Guild actors. And it's like the mom sitting there like going, Oh, nobody finished my sweet pea casserole. And then the son comes back, you know, and, and he's got, like, heart trouble and weighs 800 pounds. So the son single-handedly eats the entire sweet pea casserole by himself, has a heart attack and dies, and that's the Publix commercial. Wow. Yeah. Well done. I'll shut up now. Very well done. Here, Bob, tell us more. <laughs> Had you watched um, the older 1960s Space Ghost cartoons before that? Love it. Love it. So and we actually had an episode, Mr. Bob probably knows, because we had an episode called Warren, yeah. where my Space Ghost wanted to meet the original. He had questions oh, for him. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And we channeled him. The episode, I don't know if it's still out on YouTube or Hulu or wherever, but it's called Warren, and we channel the original Gary with a talking plant named yeah. Warren, right. and the plant was played by Colonel Bruce Hampton, 
great southern rocker, sling blade, and it doesn't get any weirder. We're all holding hands. He's like, y'all join hands and prepare to summon the spirit of Gary. <laughs> and I'm holding hands with Zorak and Clay's there going, Gary, Gary, and, and Malter, Gary, Gary, and I'm over there, Gary, Gary, and his head starts popping in this vibrating hedge that we had, which I guess was our tip of the hat to the fine folks at Python, but we had a little, a little hedge in a pot, that was Warren, and Gary pops in, well, in 1966, uh, Oh, Mr. Barbera and Mr. Hanna invited me to be the voice of Space Ghost, and oh, what an honor, what a wonderful, wonderful time it was. And, and I'm sitting there like, hey, hey, I'm Space Ghost. And he goes, no, no, I'm Space Ghost. And back and forth we do the, I'm Space Ghost. No, I'm Space Ghost. No, I'm Space Ghost. <laughs> we got into this whole thing, so that was, I didn't get to meet him. And I was heartbroken. I was just absolutely heartbroken. The biggest influence that I had that I actually got to talk to when I was coming up was Don Pardo. Oh, yeah. And like every other idiot in the universe, I said, hey, Don, you know, we're just talking. You sound like a regular guy. I said, you don't sound like you. How many times have you heard this? Yeah. Don's answer for you don't sound like you was the best answer I ever heard from anybody in my life. He goes, well, George... That's because I'm not using my money voice. <laughs> Just right into it. And it took off like a Learjet. Dude. I, I got a story like that. So uh, has anybody seen a cartoon that we make called Jerry the Belly Button Elf? Jerry the Belly Button Elf is, it's uh, Stimpy's playing with his belly button too much. And uh, he's playing with it and playing with the rings like, you better quit. Something bad's going to happen. You better leave it alone. Quit playing with it. He's going, no, oh, Ren, look, he's sharpening pencils in it and everything. And, and, uh, and, and he's up all night and he's starting to hallucinate. And, and uh, the, the belly button turns into mouth and says, come inside my world. And it's, it's Gilbert Gottfried. I hired oh. Gilbert Gottfried to do the voice. Because uh, I thought, I want it to sound like Jerry Lewis. And it has to be Gilbert Gottfried, right? So... I'm real excited. I got my cowboy tie on, and I'm like going into the studio, and, and I walk in, and there's this little tiny kind of brown guy getting water out of the water fountain, right? And I'm looking at him. I'm thinking, that could be Gilbert, but it doesn't really look like him, and I don't remember him being that tan. I'm thinking, is he? So I said, Gilbert? Gilbert, is that you? And he goes, oh, oh, hi. Hi, hello. He sounded like Mickey Mouse, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, hi, how's it going, Gilbert? Oh, I'm fine. Huh? I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and I said, what in the hell is wrong with your voice? He said, why? You want me to talk like this? I said, please, because you're scaring me. You're going to scare the other people. You're going to, please, no more. So he talked like that for the rest of the day. But no wonder he talks like that. He sounds like Mickey Mouse. I guess, you know, like um, a lot of guys like uh, Bobcat Goldwave, he was nervous. And so that, that weird voice he did was an affectation to cover the nervousness, you know? Oh, uh, okay. Wait a minute. Alex gave me the broken one. <laughs> there, there you go. Yeah, we had, uh, we had Bobcat, I think. Bobcat was three times. We had uh, an Omero Marco who used to be Letterman's girlfriend and had Ryder Mike. I didn't realize Meryl Marco went all the way back to KRP. In really? Cincinnati, yeah, she was like the, the story supervisor or something. That was a great then. show. Oh, wasn't it terrific? There were so many good comedies back then. So good, so good. But, uh, yeah, that's all I had to say about it. Can you tell everyone voices you've done of characters after Space Ghost? Well, it's funny because with me, I would go in and, and I would prepare other voices. And it got where, like, my regular thing was so popular at the network. They'd say, hey, we want you to be a mall security guy on Aqua Team. So I'd go and I'd have this whole Clint Eastwood thing ready to go. Say, you punks, get away from the golden pretzel over there. Get going. Go buy something or get out of the mall. And they're like, no, just be you. And so every time it was always, hey, you kids get away from the golden pretzel. I'd get out of the mall or buy that's like, something. That's like the, the, the thing is, you and Billy have a lot in common because you both come out of radio and you both do announcer voices. 
but he, you know, when he does an announce divorce, he's doing somebody. He's doing somebody specific, like, oh, baseball announcer. A spit, and you know, you could go, oh, I know who he's doing now. I don't always Herb know. Skip Carey, they asked me to do one on, uh, the, that would have been my second character, and Maurice got me. Maurice gets everybody. But Maurice nailed me. The, the drunk sports guy I gave him, I wanted to do kind of a drunk Skip Carey from the Atlanta Braves. Here comes a young man from Houston, a wonderful new pick out of Philadelphia. And, uh, last season, he moved all the way up to the top ranks for uh, the rookies. They're like, no, what else do you have? So I gave him the uh, kind of the NFL films guy, you know, fourth and ten. And comes the young quarterback from Sebring, Florida. Slight hair lift, a little bit of a loose colon, kind of a wild man on the field. Don't hit him too hard or he's going to have lunch come out. No, what else do you have? I'm like, a, what am I, a jukebox? And, you know, you just start. Yeah, we got that with Billy a lot. Uh, he would come in and do whole shows. He'd do ten voices, you know. And we, there were like these rates, like he could do up to three voices for so much or, and then up to five voices for another amount. But, but I tell you what, that guy makes bank. You know, he's the red M&M. And the money he makes doing one line of the red M&M you could buy a house with. Seriously, he's, he's really in the big money. What's going on with the microphone? I'm, I'm trying to pay for my house, so be sure and come by and buy lots of crap. <laughs> so what are you working on now, George? What are you, what are you doing right I'm, now? I'm working on Bob thinking of something that he can hire my ass to do. Oh, okay. Well, that's great. I, I, that's good to know. Uh, I'm working on SpongeBob doing character designs on it. I'm working for Gendy Tartakovsky. Anybody know who that guy is? Yep. He made a little thing called Dexter's Lab and Samurai Jack and, Powerpuff? and the uh, Clone that? Wars animated series. And he made all the Transylvania, Hotel Transylvania movies. And uh, he's, uh, what's going on with the, the microphone? That's really cool. I got it's, nothing. I'm waiting for that rectal cream commercial to come. <laughs> you know, now Ted can face the day feeling confident thanks to, don't they have the worst names for that stuff? They do. Thanks to new improved Asso Happy. Spelled A H S O, happy. <laughs> ah, so happy. Not taking the okay. Obvious. I got to tell one more story, and I tell this one a lot, but but it, it you you'll see the connection. So, uh, Jack Carter did this this character called Wilbur Cobb, and we did a cartoon called uh, uh, Prehistoric Stimpy, where they go to the museum and they meet Wilbur Cobb, and they think he's a a uh, the tour guide, but he's a lowly bone polisher, but they don't know that. So. Yeah, uh, so uh, he uh, he's telling he's telling Mississippi why the dinosaurs went extinct. He goes, "Well, oh, no, they, they they ran with scissors. No, no, they they went swimming a half hour after they ate. No, I, I'll tell you what killed the dinosaurs. It was jockage, really bad jockage. Well, the net, it was Jack Carter, right? So the network said, no, you can't say jockage.'" And I'm like, no, no, you can't. You, you got to say Jockage. There's ads for QX on TV all day. It's not a problem. They said, no, you can't say it. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll come up with something. I'll call you back. So I, I think a while, and I call them back. And I said, yeah, I got a, 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 tra a, a new line. And they said, what is that? I said, can we say hemorrhoids? And they said, yes. They said, yes. So I called Jack Carter in, and I said, Jack, this is the high point of your career. You better get over here right now. And, you know, this is, this is big. This is big, Jack. Come over. So he came over. And the, the way he delivered the line was great. He said, I'll tell you what killed the dinosaurs. It was hemorrhoids. Really bad head, all right. And it ran on TV, on Nickelodeon. And that's, you know, some, it is, it's a worthy death. But I think it got cut out eventually. You know, they cut out everything out. Cut out a hemorrhoidectomy. Hemorrhoidectomy. On behalf of the uh, Dallas Fantasy Fair, thank you so much, Bob Camp, George Loeb. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to our little wacky panel. <laughs>